thank you everybody for joining. I know it's late in the day, middle of the school. I got two kids running back and forth. My wife gave me a look over it. She said, hey, better hurry up and with an hour, I need you downstairs. So thank you everybody, especially with the kids. Uh, so this is, uh, so we, uh, Mike is in route uh, going to that weekend uh, uh, that, which one, the other one? The Hunter Thompson, right? The equity. Praise yeah. Fest. Yes, Praise yeah, Fest. Yeah, so I'm, I'm headed to Louisville. If you guys can hear me. You can. And uh, yeah, I'm headed to Louisville. Some people are already there, I know. But uh, we're going to have a couple events uh, while we're there as well. Some evening events tonight. Tim Mai is doing his uh, meetup. And then we have a meetup on uh, Saturday night with Massive Capital and uh, Hobnob Living, which are, which are out of Louisville. So that'll be, that's going to be cool. They got a, a local spot that they really like. And uh, we've got it set up for a nice crowd on Saturday. It's called the After Party. Uh, after the after raise party so uh, everybody's welcome to join that as as well and if you want to be in we have a whatsapp group for that if you're going to be there and uh, want to join let us know mike thank you and again and you know uh, the best time i'm mean, best way to do the deal is shake hands in person so if you guys are there please shake hands with the massive team that is there so, uh, so on the note, the way, uh, so the topic uh, for the or the agenda for the webinar is, as you know, uh, I'll spend about four or five minutes uh, to talk about who's massive capital and, and a little bit about how we partner. Uh, so then we're going to talk about some of those not investor really. It's the new development project. How we how we at a spot where we're potentially losing almost seven figures. So we'll kind of talk about it again. Uh, the idea is that to share transparently where we at, and also from your perspective, if you're an LP take a look uh, just to understand what type of work it takes to get a project and a tab lifted off the ground for new development. And if we're in GP, uh, hey, that's good to know the person as well. I mean, you know, and then take a look at from the GP and LP perspective. And if you guys have any questions, let us know. And in, in general, I'm not gonna get into the numbers. Uh, I'll keep the uh, storyline pretty high level just to kind of give you a flavor of the work and the intensity and the team and the time and the money that it needs. And if you guys have a detailed question and I can take it offline and give you some more I don't know, detail about it. So uh, who's Master Capital? As you guys know, it's us. Uh, Ajit's not here. Mike is traveling. Sanjay is traveling. I'm here. We have Jasmine. Uh, we have Candias and Maria and Ramiz and uh, Basker as well. And also we have Trevor Thompson. He's not here tonight, but he's going to join us. So all of us are full time. If you guys have any questions, reach out. And Trevor behind that, there. Is Trevor here? Yeah. Oh, hey, Trevor. Sorry, buddy. I thought you were flying. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so thank you for joining as well. And behind us, we have Paul and Ash. Uh, uh, we have PSC. Um, we have Impacts. Um, so they are our advisors and also our partners. Uh, each of them has been, uh, have been there in, into the real estate for more than 10 plus years. And I know they bring a lot of experience and know how and the advisory framework as well. Ash, I believe he's in 56, 58 deals, uh, $1.8 billion of the asset. Paul is around half a billion, and he brings a lot of new development experience from North, right? So that's, that's, that's us. Uh, and a little bit about the partnering opportunity, and uh, just to give you a flavor of where we at. So as from the massive capital perspective, we buy land, and we also do a land for new development, and we also do you know, value add uh, class B and C assets as well. We also partner with uh, others depending on what asset segment um, fits in. And you'll see how the partnership kind of plays out. In other way, we play across the value chain. Uh, we don't do conversions and we don't do land packaging. Beyond that, we are playing in across all the categories as well. And then us, uh, we, we have done across all this in six days now. Uh, what's going on in the current now? A uh, quick full disclaimer, uh, McCallum deal, uh, we are wrapping that up in about 12 days. Oh, sorry, I had my disclaimer in there. Uh, so we have seven, maybe maybe less now. Uh, so that's, that's that. It's a 506C information in our website. And, uh, um, and also reach out to anybody here if you guys have any questions or looking to invest as well. That's a 24 IRR, 2.8 multiple, five years whole time. Now, this is five years old time and flipping back, we have a new deal coming up in, in Georgetown. 
Mike is going to break the news sometime next week. So that, that is a two years uh, whole time, 1.4x, 20% RR, 7 prep, 730 LPGP. So that is going online sometime next week. Uh, so this is the new deal. It's not on the website coming up. I'm giving a heads up, I'm kind of sharing. And this is the contrast. This is the value add, typical whole time five years. This is the land play, two year cycle time. And you know the RR is more or less the same, right? No depreciation, depreciation. So, anyways, if you guys have any questions, reach out or ask one of us down the way. We'll, you know, happy to help. On that note, uh, last twelve months, last eleven months, uh, we have purchased assets anywhere is green, and then we have the Houston new development. That's the deal that we're going to talk about, which is on a contract. Uh, we have the Austin deal that I just shared in uh, Georgetown, and we have a San Antonio uh, C value add deal. Um, that's a 90, 10, 90, we can exit from the contract. It's under due diligence and 10% likelihood is going to go through given the price that it needs to be. In general, we partner with others, uh, depending on you know, who they are across all the categories from deal sourcing to at risk or the due diligence contract to close. Uh, we can be a KP of the loan and as a loan guarantor, we can bring equity into the deal and we'll also help asset management. Uh, so our goal is in general is and you know, for the local operating partners. If we're operating locally and want to grow, then we come in and we help reducing the burden on the equity and debt. And if we're an equity partner, raising others for, you know, raising uh, for deals, uh, we come in and we make your process efficient by taking out the burden for deal sourcing when we come in. Uh, so last year, I believe we have we have. We have we had 20 or 21 people that became GP working with us for the first time. And we continue to do that as well for this year. That's us. Uh, so the deal overview. And again, uh, I'm going through fairly quickly because this section is, you know, we, we talk about it pretty often. And I want to spend more time on the deal review and the Q and as we kind of go through. So back to it. This is the deal that we're talking about. It's under contract. Uh, we call it Austin at Energy Corridor. Austin is a pretty cool town. And we thought, okay, calling that would be kind of nice. Land, it's a top secret, can't share. I'm just joking. Uh, the construction cost, we, we don't know. I mean, we have an idea now, and we'll talk about it. It's a class A new development. And the location perspective, let me bring in my other screen. Okay, so... Okay, so so before I go, so just to kind of set the context, this is uh, this is Houston, and this is I ten and Beltway eight. This is the Energy Corridor that we call it. It's a deal hole uh, Highway six up until here to here, and our property it's right here. It is about three minutes drive uh, from a brand new three hundred seventeen units development from another vendor. So that was the triggering point for us. Setup perspective: uh, this is the income level. And this is the income level there. It's about eighty-seven to um, one hundred nine thousand dollars. In other way, uh, this is almost the best area you can get in terms of income. So this is KD. This is there. So demographics perspective, it's growing. And income perspective is one of the highest. And this is the core of the core location. And and uh, if you want to be a core asset, core location, this is one of the place there, right? And the availability of the land perspective, it gets really interesting um, that this is this whole project is it's a combination of one, two, and three tract. This two owned by one owner, this one owned by another owner. So all started with this property right here. And then we did the analysis here, then we kind of grew up here. So let me show you how much of a work that we have done so far and where we are. So, and again, I'm going back and forth pretty quick. Uh, hey, feel free to drop a note with the questions that we go from there. Okay, let me put on a presentation. All right, so this is, I kind of wrote it down my thoughts on it just to give an idea of the new construction workflow. Like, you know, we start with the investment hypothesis and by keeping the end project in mind with what the project looks look like, then we look around for the partners and say, hey, uh, this may be something we should take a look at it. And then we sure. get into, yes. Sorry, I think somebody said they don't see the screen. Does everybody see the screen? We can see it. 
Yeah, I can oh. see it. We can all okay. see it. Sorry. Yeah, okay, I can thank see you. it. Thank you. Okay, so, and then, you know, once you have an investment hypothesis, uh, then we go back and get into scoping. And this is where uh, typically uh, a PSA on LOI will kind of kick in. Uh, and, and then you know, the H is the horizontal, V is the vertical, right? So what we say when we look at the team, the team has to have the know-how to do the horizontals and also which is the soft development, paper development, entitlement, and the horizontal development. Then we go for the vertical. And then also you have the financing team. Uh, in that category, we also identify the scope and the schedule and we make it kind of tight. And then we do the budget and the pro forma. Uh, once the scoping happens, uh, we go through this, some due diligence, and this is where we bring in more people, more team, and then we get into soft cost. Uh, so when we get to the estimate, we started figuring out uh, what my soft cost looks like, what my horizontal and vertical look like, what my financing cost looks like. As you can see, it's the highest level. It's a conversation, some phone call, walk the site. Hey, let's get in a room. And uh, let's block out three, four hours of phone, uh, meetings. Let's run a couple of the meetings. And let's identify some of the high-level team. And this is where it, it really kicks into the detail level, right? And you know, just once that happens, as a part of the soft cost estimate development, the question is, what are we constructing? That's where design kicks in. That's where the type of construction and the unit mix and kind of works out. And our type of construction on a class A, it could be a garden style up to three or four story as you can walk from the stairs. It could be high rise uh, with an elevator on it. And or it could be a podium, which is like a two story garage and a four story building on top. Uh, or it could be a wrap, right? One, one rectangle box and a pool in the middle and a wrap as a gift box, right? There could be lots of different construction on the unit mix. To know the unit mix, we have to do market study. We have to figure out what's happening now, what's going to happen three years from now, what's going to happen in between, whether people are coming in, they're moving out, whether they will have money to pay the cost, all this, all this fun stuff. As we look at the construction and the unit mix and the estimate, we're also looking at the timeline. So we have to kind of figure out what the city is going to do. Whether they like apartments, don't like apartments, what the timeline looks like, what the risk looks like. And then you get into the construction. When everything gets finalized, uh, you get into construction again. Within the construction is continuous financing and optimization of labor, optimization of material. Once it's done, you do a list up and then you do a macro, right? The whole thing. And now, typically the red star is here. And this is where we close the property. This is where we take the construction loan. This is where we say we have extremely uh, certainty where the whole format that we are forecasting three years out, we're gonna get close to it. So, but in the early phase, we are running the whole sequence you know, simultaneously but all the time. So that's that's that. Yes, again. Uh, so that's a typical workflow. But interestingly, even though it feels that way, the whole project is backwards. That means everything starts here. What's our hypothesis of the economy, local and the macro, and the cost and the revenue will be three years out. It takes about a year to you know to go to the entitlement process. City approval, but a year, year and a half to do the construction and half a year to year and a half uh, to your lease up, right? So interestingly, everything, it's here. We take a look what happens three years from now, and then we call the property management companies and say, hey, based on your experience, what kind of rent you're going to get? And they're going to tell us for me to get whatever rent you want, Shire, I need to have a certain type of you know, construction. And that's going to tell us how long city is going to take. And this type of construction, this type of style will tie into the construction. That's going to back into the cost. That's going to back into the team. So even though we go this way and are from here to here, it's really backwards, right? We start with three years out. So in, in general, also, our principle has been from the massive perspective that we don't do a deal where we know. Uh, we don't do a deal where the, our team's net worth is two to three X of the loan size because of the volatility of the market. Uh, we also, our team got to have three to six months of working capital. And we at the GP team must be putting the money at risk first before we get to that. So that's the typical definition. I mean, that's a typical route uh, for a new development thing. So in other way, if you, if you compare new construction with a you know existing asset value add, the money at risk is very less 
uh, in the new construction, I mean, sorry, in the existing asset class. And the time is spent, go from the LOI to closing, it's very less compared to you know, new development. It's a front heavy, it's a team heavy, it's expense heavy uh, in our project. And, and so the GP team has to go through that and the process before we do that. So, so in general, uh, project, it's a lot of time. Inception, scoping, this is where we start spending money. Estimate, we spend more money. Design, we spend more and more money uh, before you get to city approval, even they're running the whole thing. So, so this one, you know, for us, uh, so just to kind of give you an idea that how the time and the money being spent before you get to uh, here, where we have extremely certainty, extreme certainty that project is going to get approved. And at that point in time, we said this project is marketable, this is investable, bank is on our side, market is on our side, and let's go and you know, raise money to take a construction loan to get to the construction. Okay. Any questions, comments, thoughts? Um, this one so far? Not yet, okay, that's cool. Now, reflecting back again, we're, we're talking openly, and uh, some of the things that you, you're gonna hear us talk about it is tough to find, or not that many people will talk about it. So this is, this is my, down and you know, kind of handy dandy chart, right? We started the project. We really picked up the project at Q3. Um, we started end of the Q2, and then in a Q3 we really spent a lot of time. Uh, the first PSA was down in June, so July, August, September, October, November, December, and here we are. And second PSA was cut in September. Remember on the picture we showed that all started with the one rectangle property, then we added another one. That's the second PSA. We had location knowledge. We own properties there. We have the market knowledge. We own the properties there. Project management. We have the project management knowledge, but I don't think so. It's quite applicable to a new construction project at this caliber, right? So I went, we went from a yes to maybe. Entitlement knowledge, when we started, we didn't have it. Now we have a pretty good clarity. What does it take uh, for the entitlement? Uh, PSA is purchase to sale agreement, which is a sales contract. Thanks, Carter. And the construction knowledge, we thought we had it, but we didn't quite have it because all of our knowledge based on you know, building 50 or 20 townhomes on a hotel, not quite existing uh, construction. And then uh, cost knowledge, we thought we knew about it, but then we got into the design and the construction. We saw the integrity of it and the, and the optionality of the construction. So... <laughs> We thought we had it, then we realized we didn't have it, then we got a team, and then we figured out, yes, we almost got it, right? And the macro outlook, we thought we, we had it, then we thought its market's going to go crazy. Now we are getting an idea where the market's going to be. The interest rate, when we started, we didn't know how high and where it's going to be. Now we have a clarity about the interest rate that we have. Uh, I see a raise hand, Tarek. Um, Hi, sorry for interrupt, uh, but I would like to say that uh, there are some people trying to join us uh, here, but I think we are hundred per hundred uh, people. So if we, if there is any way to expand, because people are a little bit frustrated. Oh, oh, oh! I am so sorry. Let me see. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm trying. To, uh, I don't know if there's a way to let them in now. Sure. Let me see if I can um, upgrade the account. <laughs> this is the first time we we reached hundred, so. Uh, please bear with us for a second. That's great. Thank you. That's a good problem. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, good problems you have. Hey, uh, you learn as you go, right? Uh, so we're growing I have no idea. Sorry, guys. Uh, everybody, just give me uh, give me a couple of seconds. See what what we can do. Uh, okay. All right, here you go. You had your hand raised. How are you? I am upgraded business. It's not letting me do it. So I guess uh, we can do another session or we can send the webinar. But I'm not sure exactly how to kind of go about it. And it looks like the pricing is not making sense to me. So uh, sorry. We, we, uh, so I told everyone, you got to come early if you want to be part of the session, right? To show up early, get the in. You know, we'll uh, we'll let people know, and uh, we'll be doing some uh, upgrades for our, our future opportunities now that we've, uh, you know, 
solve we'll solve for the next problem coming up so i would just say you know we'll have we'll share what we've got and uh keep going shirayer and uh, cool yeah we will share the recording okay well, <laughs> thank you and we'll and do really thank you everybody yeah we'll do, we'll do another session if uh, we need Yes, absolutely. We can do take two on that as one. Well. Hey, we don't mind talking about so we'll just, the we'll money that we Thanks. Yeah. Uh, Bodhi, you had a question? Then Brooke, I'll get to you. Hey, guys. Um, two things. One, I couldn't get online on the computer, but it let me get online on my phone. I don't know what the difference is, but... <laughs> Um, the other thing is, do you, when you're doing all this uh, new construction or any of these large value adds, do you have an owner's representative in the construction, like a project construction manager or somebody that you use for you, not just working through the contractor? Got it. So at this point in time, we are debating which way to go. We don't have it at this point. So that's a very good question that how do we integrate into the developer? So our take is, so that's a very good question. It is, it is okay, it's, it's right around here, but it shows up at the design phase, right? So for us, we're looking at, uh, we don't know what type of contract will be best. Is it the cost plus, or this is all in, right? So depending right. on that, if it's a cost plus, I need the owner rep, someone is managing, making sure that it is happening, accounting, bookkeeping, all those other stuff. If it is all in, then hey, as long as you get it, get the permitting, your cost, I, I don't have a risk for my cost at all. It's cost goes to the developer side of it. So we're not keen about having an owner rep baked into the their, you know, well, their work process. I can tell you from experience, that's probably a mistake. Mistake, okay. Um, just because you have an all-in contract doesn't mean that your best interest is being served. You need to have somebody that works for you to go and check these projects, making sure everything is getting done correctly, looking at things before you make payments, to make sure that everything is the percentages that the contractor is billing you for oh, okay. is actually correct. Got it. And to make Got it. sure, you know, that things are being done correctly, but just okay. food for thought. Thank you. I misunderstood. So yes, for if we were to do this deal, we're going to have in-house construction manager doing exactly what you're asking, managing us, making sure things are going. Yes, thank you. It's going to be about right. $70 million project. Nobody should do a $70 million project unless you have your people checking every single thing happen. Right? So yes, Absolutely. Well, that is, I misunderstood. But thank yes, 100% aligned. No problem. Thank you. Brooke, you had a question? Yes, I actually have two. So first question is, do you have a, what is your preference, new construction or assets like McCallum? You know, a class B asset is already mostly filled, right? And two, when it comes to the debt, how are you proving to the bank and giving them confidence that you're going to have this filled with tenants? Got it. So debt and the team. So back to here. Uh, the new development, we are partnering, right? We're going to do both, right? We don't have any, you know, decision hierarchy in terms of which one should go, which one should not go. The way we take a look at it, everything has a time and a place for it. We build a team big enough. We have partners good enough where we can facilitate new construction. We want to do about three to four new constructions uh, at every given year, run that flow. And then we're going to do about, you know, the class C, I mean, the value adds. Some of them will be the McCallum type, $30 million or higher. Uh, some of them will be $20 million or lower. So short answer is we're going to do it all. We don't have any bandwidth issue. It's the project quality issue that, that we are looking for. Right? Project has to make sense for us to do it. It has so we can increase the likelihood of delivering what we said we're going to do. Second question, back to your debt. That's a very good question. So this construction, this financing, right? This financing factors in the exit outlook. When we go to the bank, let's say we engage the bank right here already. So this is going to be a construction debt. This is a bridge debt. And this is going to be 8 9% interest rate. And there's nothing we can do about it, right? So we engage the lender already here. So as we are building the construction type and the unit mix, figuring out the cost, we are working with lender to see what the, what the sizing of the construction will want going to look like and what the rate is going to look like. So by the time we get to here and we get this one, 
lender will check it. Lender is going to approve the project. Lender is going to say, or Massive Capital, we, we are in line with you for your forecast of macroeconomics and what's going to happen three years from now. We are in line with the impact of that in the Houston market. We are in line with the revenue. That's because you hired the property management company who does this, like, you know, such as Great Steel or RPL. And so we are in line with that. We also like the construction team. We also vet them out. We know their cost. We have and have given them loan before. So all in all, everything is good. I'll get you the loan right here. So lender is already working with us throughout the whole process. Okay, fabulous. Good okay, good question. Thank you. Thank you. So no problem. Thanks. So and then you know this is where the money. So we are, and even though we're spending money up until here, we are running the whole cycle very shortly. Uh, example: when we started, we thought we're going to develop only two acres that had a different kind of construction. It's narrow, six-story with two-story garage. And then we got into the issue, my construction cost is extremely high because the garage costs you $2 million. And we brought in another advisor who is building seven of these now in Dallas area. He said, Shariah, to add some, to reduce the risk of your project, what do you do? You go bigger. So instead of 150 units, you expand it and you build 300 units. So you get some breathing room into the project. So we went back and got that in. And you know, that's what we thought we knew the construction knowledge, but then we realized talking to someone who was doing seven of these projects, we don't have that understanding, right? So the self-realization. Uh, so, so now we went from 150 to 250. And then we got into the issue of the water containment. And then there's a cell tower. And we came back out, we went up to 315 units now. So right now we're looking at 315 units. It's a six-story, four-story, sorry, four-story garage in the corner and a you know, six-story total building, right? This is really good looking building as of now. So that's why we said, hey, and you know, then we thought, hey, we thought reconstruction and we know that, you know, we also understand the cost knowledge, but we don't. Uh, that's because when, you know, everything comes from experience, right? Uh, the question is, do I, am I hiring the engineering firm who builds Ferrari or am I hiring the engineering firm who builds Honda, right? I'll get a different kind of product but it all depends on what's my revenue forecast look like. So we we went to the Ferrari engineers first and we had a sticker shock. And then we, we said, okay, this life, maybe this is the one. Then we worked our way down. We optimized the design uh, to a point we got to the Honda engineers now. So price makes sense, forecast makes sense. So we believe we have an almost knowledge about the cost. We understand that we don't have the deep expertise into the knowledge, uh, but at the same time, we understand now entitlement knowledge, right? So we brought in a new team who's going to help us from the entitlement process. We have identified the construction team. And our definition of the construction team was someone who has done at least, someone who has the business for at least a decade. They have done at least five of them last 15 months. And they have done at least one or two of them in the Harris County city of Houston. That means you have to have the local know-how. Someone from Seattle cannot come down to Houston and do a project in the Harris County where they don't know. So every, everybody that we partnered with and hired, they have local, even a zip code and a knowledge base so they can do everything, right? So back to it, okay. So, so in general, what we have done, uh, we spent the money here. Most of the money that we spent here is understanding uh, that the capacity of the water line, capacity of the sewer line, then also do a, you know, we brought in property management company, interviewed four of them, we're down to one of them, where we're going to do. And each of the property management company, they underwrote this asset their own way. And they gave us their view. We went through the process. And then we settled on one property management company we like. We feel like there's a good fit for it. And that's one. They gave us the confidence on the pro forma in terms of revenue on top of our beliefs. So we cross checked that. And we did some traffic study. We did an Alta survey. And we went through three rounds of you know, design which is developing one and, a half, one and a half acres, doing 150 units to 250 units to 315 units. And every time we do them, it costs money, right? So in general, when we started, uh, it's, we had big beliefs and strong self-perception and we got smacked on the head a little bit. And we thought we had a strong team uh, and we thought we'll figure it out as you go. And we thought money was at risk 10 to 15K. Where we are not now, uh, so the, the perception got challenged quite a bit. And now we have a strong team who has been there, done that from entitlement. So we feel extremely confident that, hey, if we chose to move that forward, 
in eight months down the way, our team can bring the and a project back out from the city of Houston, all stamped. We spent about thirty thousand dollars, twenty-seven, twenty-eight thousand dollars for the survey civil and architect. We have fifty grand money at hard, and market is really against us, right? So that's that's where we are. So if we choose to exit today, the whole point is we're going to be walking away with roughly eighty thousand dollars of loss, right? Which is okay because of the nature of the game. But again, we are not in a business of losing money, right? We're in a business of making money. So we have to we kind of push that forward. And right now we are interviewing the construction company. And we have brought in some knowledgeable people who has been there, done that quite a bit. And on that gentleman who is doing seven of this. So we have identified ways to offset the loss associated with the interest rate. Can't talk about it. We'll talk about it later when the project comes through. In other way. When we started this project, interest rate was five, five and a half percent. Right now it's almost 10%. We're expecting two more interest rate hike. So if we were to break ground end of the uh, year, this year, we're expecting at best we're gonna get six percent to six and a half percent interest rate. Right. So we lost you know, quite a bit of money for my financing. And then we have identified a way uh, to do some partnership work with the city and where we can offset the money that we lost. So all of a sudden the project, even though we do everything right. The project went negative because of the interest rate. Now we are bringing the back to green again by offsetting some of the ways that we can offset the cost. Uh, we are continuously underwriting. Uh, we are continuously debating whether we phase out the project or we exit or we buy the next door property and we buy and hold for a year and a half, come back and do the project. Because our belief that uh, this is a core asset in a core location right next to a 300 unit apartment that's a class A. So location has been de-risked and it just makes sense. And we'll just continue with this one now. So uh, I'll stop here. So we are at loss as of today, but we are finding our way out. And one of the points that we're trying to make that project at this size, about a $70 million size, putting $100,000, uh, it is at the low side of it. But again, we, are, we have a very uh, strong insight about taking the loss out. So let's see worst case scenario, we lose the money. We, we, we work our way through, get the $50,000 money out, but we get $30,000 at loss, at least numerically. But what happens on the other side, we have three of these projects uh, in the works, uh, here and Dallas area, right? And so here, Austin and Dallas. That $30,000 at uh, money that we spent, it is very cheap way of identifying teams identifying the knowledge and also getting it that we can implement into the other two projects, make our money back out and still be happy with it. So the point is, it's a pay to play. The team has to be strong enough. The team has to be you know, resilient enough to work your way out and also willing to walk away spending the money when it's needed before we put anybody else's money at risk. All right. That was a lot for me. I'll take a pause, questions, comments, 20 minutes. I met my timeline. Hi, um, just for curiosity's sake, I would like to know, um, let's assume you, you, you go ahead with this project. What will be your exit? Because um, yes, you, this is very capital intensive. Um, so what would you exit at? Let's assume you, you are bringing in investors. Are you going to hold it? What, are you going to sell it off? So the goal is to exit. Uh, it's always an option. So we're running three scenarios. Uh, so the, there's one capital event here, another capital event here. So when the construction ends, that's the potential exit. So that could be three years from now. And if depending on the market, if we think it'd be beneficial to go to the lease up, then exit, then that could be a capital event. And that could be an option. And third option is you buy the hold. And because, you know, it's tough to get a class A asset. It's tough to buy a multifamily and it's extremely competitive to buy a class A asset in a core location. And if you have an asset waiting for us, they refi and move on, right? So those are the three potential exit timeline. At CO, post lease up, and you buy and hold. Okay, okay. Um, then what would you decide to, to do a construction when you can get a class A, just like what Brooke said? Is it not um, financially and risk-wise, is it not better? to just buy a, a class A property than doing a, a direct construction from, from ground zero? Better or worse, uh, that's relative based on who we are, right? 
And um, uh, if we do the project right, then every single bucket, every single step must be profitable. What I meant to say, if I buy this property at a $5 million tier, by the time I get a, a you know, city approval, the property value must go from a five to seven, $8 million. By the time we finish the construction, property value must be you know, profitable than what we have spent when we exit. So it's there. So everybody has a play. Some people say, I want to just buy class A. I don't want to go through the whole entitlement process, build it and that. That's their play. And some people say, I want to do the lease up. And then I will you know, flip it. That's my play. Some people do construction. Some people do land only. For us, going back, the way we build the organization, we buy land. You know, we bought quite a bit of lands already. We do a small size of land banking. And we have Paul who has been there, done that. So between us, he's spearheading the whole land development and the building. And we run plus C. So if you can create value across the value chain, why pacing it? Thank you. Nice. Thanks. Uh, how, then I said, how do you determine what the whole time is? Okay. Very good question. So that's a question um, that comes in here right? The whole time is. So back to your question, how do you determine what the whole time is? It depends. Going back to a scenario, uh, ideally we can exit after land, ideally exit after construction, ideally exit after ex I mean, after lease up and stabilize. If we choose to, uh, you know, so that depends on when we also start, right? So it all depends on the strategy and depends, you know, what time of the market cycle we're starting our construction, right? Uh, at best, I would say five years exit, and then I'll see a three-year exit. Then I say a six months exit. So that's that's the timeline that looks like. Good question. Uh, what type of IRR for the investment? Oh, oh, wow, wow, this is good. I like it. So uh, that's going to depend on where we come in and what we do, right? Uh, for us, from the finance perspective, it's not the return; it is the risk adjusted return. Right. What I meant to say, let's think about existing asset class. If you go to a neighborhood, I have to wear a bulletproof vest. That's a different kind of return versus if I go to a neighborhood, I have to wear a tuxedo. Right. Tuxedo requires less than a return. So in this case, just looking at the uh, buying the existing asset class A and running it, this is around 15 IRR. On the land perspective, it is one of the riskiest uh, things. So we try to do about 20 IRR, if not 20 plus IRR. And the construction and you know this one, it's it's TBD somewhere between a 17 and a 20. Uh, do you consider purchasing in title land and going through the process? Uh, so Amy, that's a very good question. Uh, so yes, as of now, depend, depending on the market cycle and where we at, uh, if someone brings a entitled property, then yes, we're gonna take a look at it. Uh, but we don't want to go through an entitlement process unless we have a location know-how. Uh, so risk in perspective, we feel like market is already at risk. So we, we, what we don't do, buy raw land where we don't know what we're going to do with it. We have to have some understanding. Uh, in this case, we know the location. We have a strong understanding about the location. And literally three minutes down south, there is a 300 units uh, came online. So the risking of the location is gone. Very similar to the Georgetown property that we have um, that we are working on. Uh, so we have a very strong understanding of the location because the land development team had a piece of property about three, four minutes out down uh, uh, east side of it. So they did the homework already by buying another one and putting the homework back. But I don't know. So back to your question, yes, we'll do it, but we have to have a solid understanding about the location we're not going to get into area, which is extremely green for us. That's another question. Okay. Jasmine, anybody else raise their hand? I, uh, sorry, I'm trying to figure it out. Megana does. Okay. Hey, Megana, please uh, go for it. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Good okay. to see you. Um, so... Have you started to raise capital for this project? No, it's not ready. We okay. don't raise capital unless you have extended certainty, right? It hasn't been, it has too much risk in the point to bring anybody else in beyond us. Okay. And given that you have such an amazing uh, track record of going after awesome properties that are already uh, cash flowing day one, 
uh, do you wonder if once you lock this and you begin to raise capital, uh, this may you know raise uncertainties for your investors where you not that you will lose credibility, but more so, why are you now focusing on this and it may take away from a lot of other already cash producing um, properties. And again, I am, I'm always very skeptical. I'm super positive. Like people don't think that I'm skeptical, but I'm always thinking, how would I be perceived that I am raising capital for 10 properties? And all of a sudden my energy and my team's energy is going to shift into like uh, breaking ground and doing all of this. And I'm not questioning the capital raising because I do know that there are a lot of investors who are very interested for higher returns to invest in these sorts of properties. But for you guys, since you already have have this um, a name for yourselves of being specialized in already existing buildings, shifting, like do, how do you guys feel about uh, doing both? Got it. I know. Fantastic question. I love it. First of all, Anytime you do something, any kind of investment, you we need to be at unease uh, all the time, right? Money is at risk. Something is working. Big risk happen. So without the unease, and uh, it is tough to manage, right? So if you ask me, am I, are we unease all the time? Absolutely so, right? And which is also why we talk about openly where we at. So, so that's that's that one. So be unease at all time. Ask questions. You know, look over your shoulder. Look twice, three times, four times till you feel comfortable, right? Uh, because there's some risk that you have to go through up until you do risk it is always a problem right uh, so that's one now uh, we look at it things two ways now the question that you ask is right because at some point you say hey why don't you build here why don't you build here right uh, or why don't you focus on that so we look at it two ways number one it is all about the bandwidth and the know-how uh, so our specialty is two places one is running the operations we have sanjay as a CEO. He runs assets and his role is to running operating asset that's all he does he doesn't come into the play and building a business line or how to do about it he knows what he's going to get if you buy the class a but this is not his time spent right he stays right here so the time and the focus spent under his umbrella is very dedicated right this development we have psc's here they're special they have thousand doors under construction right now their specialty is new construction this is their time we're leveraging theirs, not us. Well, we know what we don't know, right? I don't know new construction. As I just said before, we had some learnings as well, but you're getting a flavor of So we are leveraging our partners to get to the new developments, right? And the last question is the financing. I'm sorry, uh, is the investment, right? To me, do I take a look at it? US is my marketplace to invest. My money should not care where does it, what the color of the building looks like. Its job is to make returns, right? The way we take a look at it is our role is to identify the assets that has a higher likelihood of uh, being successful and deploy the money that way. That's it. And also, if you think about it, there are some investors uh, will they like new development, and some investors like land, some investors I don't know like class C value adds. And we have a bigger pool of team members. We have a bigger pool of investor base. We understand not everything is for everybody. But from the money perspective, if you can bring in the right set of you know, assets, why not? And our goal is to bulk up this portfolio. Either we go buy directly or we go develop and bring it to this side. Ultimate goal is to have as many assets as you can. And our question is, how do we compete in the market, right? What's the likelihood of for us buying a class A asset every six months as a guaranteed fashion? Zero. Uh, but if you can create a certainty that, hey, three years down the way, two years down the way, there's going to be a building waiting for us. And if we have two or three coming up every year down the way, so we're going to go dry for the first two or three years, then it starts stacking up every single year, right? It's a cool way to buy assets without buying assets, right? So that's that's why. It's a messy, but it's a tactical way of going about it. Um, we are Our strategy is supported by the team, supported by the skills, then we're kind of going around it. I love it. and I. I absolutely agree with the vision. Uh, we cannot rely on one one source of um, of um, I don't want to say income, but given that there's a shortage in in these buildings, it's so smart that while you are constantly looking for new properties out there, at the same time 
you you pretty much bring into life your own properties and they'll be 10 times, 100 times better because you are learning from existing properties. So I absolutely love the idea. I was just, um, again, curious to to know how you guys feel at the moment, given that the St. Maria's and the Jasmine and the Brooks will go out there and say, hey, massive capital, we're now going to race for something that is going to be in service three years from now then. Oh, really? So you're shifting now? So I just wanted to know um, if you're ready for that, for those answers, but I'm, I'm, I love it. This is excellent. Hell yeah, Very I good am. <laughs> so cool. You know, and I'm going to jump in, Magana, because I had a handful of investors tell me no because they like the newer developments because there are more returns for mm-hmm. them. So this gives me ammo to go back to those people because I know who you are. And a couple of you are on this call. So I will be reaching back out to you when this, uh-huh. if this kicks off. <laughs> oh, look so, out. yeah, I like it's good to provide some options. But yeah, it's, so it's good for me. <laughs> Yes. And just to uh, piggyback on Brooke, that's why we like to talk to investors and get to know them. And I, I like to know what position they are because some investors, they don't really need the cash flow quarterly. You know, they are looking for a more equity multiplier. So the higher the risk, the more the equity multiplier will be higher. So it just depends on, you know, having different options and just find the investment that is going to be the right fit for every investor. It's not like we're just going to push you in any deal. You know, it's like some, I have had investors that I told them, like, I don't think this is the right deal for you right mm-hmm. now for the position that you are. But I know in the long term is going to be a, an investor who, who, who knows that I'm really watching out for him, you know, looking out. So, yeah. And, it's pretty and that's why you know, note down why they say no. So for all the people who are syndicators out there, when you're getting to know your investors and when they give you the reasons why this is not the deal for them, note that you should have a spreadsheet or have it in your phone under the note somewhere. So when you have a deal that comes up and the opportunity is for them, hey, you mentioned this. One, it shows you care. Two, it shows you were listening to what they said, right? So Absolutely. And big. this is a long-term a relationship building and now buildings are being built at a much uh, faster pace. And uh, I personally, you know, would love to, to be an investor in the brand new buildings. If I had the option, sometimes it's worth waiting a little bit longer and going in the deal that, that speaks, speaks to you. And, um, and like you guys said, like have that option diversity. And one more question. Um, you said that the it's under contract, but it's closing in July. So yes, we're gonna st- we're gonna extend it, and uh, so so we don't know exactly the, what the timing will look like. So it's not this is a half baked project. It's not quite ready out for anything yet. We have quite a bit of work to do. What we have to do really, we have to figure out uh, that going back. Uh, sorry, here that what the macro and finalize the pro forma and the issue that we got into is that we lost that the profit margin of the project went down heavily because of the interest rate. Because if we take a $40 million loan for a year and a half at 8%, uh, two points, and at a 65%, 70% LTV, which is much different than taking a loan at 80% LTV, 85% LTV at a 4%, right? So we lost quite a bit of margin there. And we're trying to figure out the number two here, how do we offset the loss that we have? And then then we'll come back, right? So it's not ready for raising yet. It just we're just sharing that how complex is the thing. We're six years, six months into it. We have at least four people us looking at it all day long, and we bid that to the ground quite a bit. But still, sometimes it doesn't work out, right? That's because the market is going to take a good project or a bad project. It, it was extremely profitable project. It was slam dunk even a year and a half ago. It was extremely good earlier last year, and right now it's a bad project. Everything was constant, right? It's the interest rate kicked it. It's sometimes timing has a way, and now we have to, uh, you know, we brought in some of those uh, other players, uh, other senior operators or developers. They're giving us guidance on how to kind of go about it. That's right. So short answer, it's not ready to raise. It's just the open conversation that how complex new development could be. And when you look at it, when you look at getting into new construction, uh, make sure when you ask the question to GP team, the certainty of the city approval and certainty what the end goal looks like. Right. So well, that was... I- I love it. And I just want to say how happy I am for the entire team and, and for, for myself personally to be part of this ecosystem because this is a mastermind. There's always something new. It's never boring. And 
And when you think you're learning about a specific niche, then you are taking us into a different journey and it's, it's never ending. And I just love it that we are, you guys are adding so much value personally. And I know for everyone else in, in this club, in this room. So get that upgrade on zoom because it's going to be <laughs> a lot more people. And, and Silvius yeah. is next and he's agreeing with me. So back to you guys. Thank you. <clears throat> So, Silvius, please, uh, you had a question? I don't have a question per se. I just want to bring in a fresh perspective from the construction point of view to please. everyone that does not have experience. So, um, I've been building skyscrapers in Manhattan for the past 18 years, from the ground up, from the foundation up. And trust me, we're so busy like never before. And Miguel, you live in New York. You know what I'm talking about. Vlad, you drive around them every day, right? So trust me, there is a lot of money at stake there and they all work. Yes, this might be a bad time at this point, but from the construction point, everybody gets paid. That's right. And it's, it's even more difficult here because we're all unionized. So the cost of labor is so much higher than is some other parts in the United States, like oh, Dallas 100%. and Austin. So it's not that complicated, trust me. I've been on these projects. I'm a surveyor engineer. That's what I've been doing. So I deal with like 4,000 pages of plans every day. And everything gets built. If you get the right builders in place, then you have to have some systems. There's some inspectors that are going to be hired. That is a third party. They walk around with a tablet and they check everything constantly. So that's part of the ownership. They, they create reports for the owners all the time. So as long as the construction stays on time, everybody makes money. And what I like about this whole process, it completely light, like it lit me up. I'm on fire. I like, this is what I want to hear. Like I'm, I'm all about class C, it's fine. And class B, but you want to really make me uh, like real money. You want to create opportunity and wealth. I think this is the best way to go. Around. It's, it's the it best has this amount of margin and it has a deep expertise that is needed. Um, you know, to kind of, so you're right, 100% agree if the team is, makes sense. Because you know, if you think about it, construction cost is more or less set. How much you're going to go? Oh, it's fixed. Time. It's a fixed cost. It's nothing you can do about it. Yep. Then the rent, what I can get is pretty fixed. Nothing I can do about it. Only play that I have, it's, and how many square foot do I build and what's my loan looks like, right? And now it's, the it's a semi fixed yeah. That's the opportunity right there. So the opportunity of, of getting into a class A through new construction, you get most of your chances. That's right. That's, that's, right. that's what it is. If you're trying to get everything else, then you're going to pay a lot of money for it. I mean, the builders need to sell out a profit, and that number is huge most of the times. That's why Very not good. everybody can, can get in. Okay. And, Thank you, you know, uh, no problem, no. No, very good point. So case in point, before we, and as we are working on this deal, we had an opportunity to get into a 22-story high-rise building in Florida. Uh, so in Orlando, Florida, the counterparty was a family office, Dr. Patel from Florida. They have like $2 billion of equity or something like that. And we had interviews. We had, we went through them. They sat through us, but we walked away happy. I mean, walked away happy for not doing the deal. But upside was there. Absolutely. But the issue that we had, nobody in that team has built a high rise before that is worth 110 million. Too many new people hanging out with the new place, trying to do new thing. It's just way too much risk. It's just way too much risk. Uh, so, Cody, you got a question? And yeah, Salvador, by the way, I'm sharing this one for you. Um, go ahead. I've got more, more of a comment, something that uh, Svelta just said. And you were saying, uh, um, I disagree on something because if we learned anything from COVID and supply chain issues and everything else, it doesn't matter if you have a fixed contract or not. If materials aren't available and you're being delayed, yes. or even if the contractor says it's fixed, somewhere in his contract, it's going to say if the if the expenses go up on the materials that you're going to be paying for it. So <clears throat> don't don't ever assume that fixed cost is fixed cost. I know you know that as an engineer, but uh, it's people make that mistake all the time. I've done, a, I've been in construction for 35 years, built hotels, apartment, you name it, no skyscrapers, but anything, 
anything 10 stories or less, I've, I've been on the ground building them. So either the contractor is going to get paid more or he's going to go bankrupt. That's right. And you're going to have to get another contractor and that's going to cost you a lot more money. So 100%. one way or another, you're going to pay. Oh, 100%. So it is, it's a build up what Fordy was talking about when we talk about the construction cost all in. It, that's because we are so close to taking a loan, getting and breaking the ground, even though there is a big. So we assume the tail end risk like a COVID, something like that will not happen with the assumption we go in. But if something were to happen, a healthy contractor will say, look, my price point is tied up to this future index. If it is plus minus 10 percent, I'll absorb it because I'm good enough. I buy big enough. If it goes bust, the way lumber price went up, skyrocketed, then the contract will say, hey, I'll pass on the cost because contractor, they just not in the control of the price, right? They can manage a little bit, but not beyond that boundary line that we have. So point, 100% point, we'll take it. Uh, trade export, no. Oh, yes, 100%, okay. Now, very good questions, thank you. And I think uh, just to kind of wrap up the on the Salvador's question, and uh, this is the type of return that we take a look at it because you know, we expect to have a little bit higher return on the land just the land play. Like this Georgetown, it's a purely land play. We bought the land law, we're gonna raw, we're gonna go through the entitlement process, then we'll exit. Two year cycle time, no depreciation, cash on cash play, and you go 20%, right? If you extrapolate two years to five years, it's almost, you know, look at the return size, right? Like three X return. And that's the type of return that we kind of look for uh, on, the, on the land side. And what happens on the construction, I don't know. Uh, it's going to depend on where we at. It's going to depend on the interest rate. Uh, but our goal is to give bring in a uh, stronger risk adjusted return. That means if it, if there is a risk associated with it, if Billy gives you seventeen percent, we should be able to give you eighteen percent. Or if Billy's project has higher risk than us and he does give you seventeen, then if we offer you seventeen, which our project should have slightly less risk than that one. So risk adjusted, you get better project. That's how we compare. And that's how we try to you know, stay within our boundaries. But as of now, we just don't know what it looks look like. But it's kind of between 17 and 19. Uh, what else? Uh, build in the heart. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Uh, thank you, Tracy. Good point. We always have contingency uh, on, on there. There are two, two layers of contingency. Or first, I'm mean, sorry, a contingency each of the phases. The land development phase has a contingency, and the construction phase has a contingency. So example, if we were to do this project, we're gonna say, hey, uh, we are paying the cost and we're paying it for the entitlement process. So the Georgetown projects, we can do all of ourselves, or we can say, hey, we are gonna go to the entitlement process. We're gonna raise some money, but everybody gets out once that entitlement is done. And, and they get the first shot going into the construction and we bring in new construction. They could be out when we do a refi, uh, or something like that. We just don't know still how that's going to play out. Uh, it is 7.03 beyond the line uh, timeline uh, that we have allocated. So we appreciate your time. Uh, we can continue a little bit more if you guys have any more questions. Uh, otherwise, you know, from the Massive team and Massive family, we really appreciate you guys uh, being here and allowing us to share our projects uh, as we go through this. Thank you, Sharir and Team Massive Capital. Thank you so much. Thanks. Sure. Great call. Thank you. Thanks. Great call. <laughs> Sharir, you know. um, Balaji here. Hey, Balaji. Yeah, thanks for your guidance. Uh, thanks for taking my call the other day. Uh, uh, I'll text you. Uh, maybe if you can give me your email ID, I want to get into a Zoom call. Uh, if that is okay. okay. Yeah, That's yeah. fine. And I saw your uh, WhatsApp message, but I didn't get this. I think that wasn't something I was looking for. I think we're looking for the other information. I'll look at my chat box. It's Shariah at Massive.Capital. Yeah, yeah. I'll do that. Yeah. Thank you. I would say shoot me a text. Whenever send me an email, shoot me a text. We can get on a phone call in five minutes and knock it out. Yeah, sure. sure. Yeah. Thanks. Thank thanks, for, thanks for your time. Okay. Uh, I will have a very quick question. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> like the no, go ahead. It's very general. Sorry. So, okay. uh, if you have the opportunity again uh, to, ha if you have the opportunity again to have uh, the new construction that you need to build, I know it's general question, but you will better do like 
just buy or go back and build? I'll do both. Do both. Yeah. And it depends, right? Uh, and I'll do both. If you ask me, uh, yeah. I'll buy land, I'll do construction, I'll buy new shit. So back to your point, right? It, how you design yourself to do whatever you want to do. A typical syndicating team said my specialty is in a class C assets, right? But what happens when the market goes up and down? You're mm -hmm. stuck. My specialty is class A. What happens market goes up and down? You're stuck, right? What happens you do land development? You're stuck, right? So, but we said we, we're here to stay on the, uh, all those P farms who has over half a billion dollars worth of assets. They play across all the category, but they grow as you go. And we have the team. So why not going all together at the same time, right? So that's how. So just, you know, case in point, we have nine team members all full-time working on it now. And we are actively looking for two more uh, folks to join us as a W-2 basis, right? So we're growing. We have the time and the skill set so we can cut across all the asset classes as well. And also we have we have been there, right? So that's it. the new development part. It's a little bit more a uh, learning curve for us. It's our biggest learning curve is the new development uh, because they, it's geographically located. On the construction, we're there on land. And uh, I love dirt, if you ask me. I have a thing for land. So And Jasmine too, right? You know. Uh, and we have a thing for land, so we, we get the land and we buy quite a bit, right? So here we go. Sounds great. Yeah. Thank you. Oh. And I love land. The land is the coolest thing ever. But it's yeah. tough when you buy. But it's, it, it's the worst thing ever because it doesn't cash flow. When you're stuck, you're stuck. If it doesn't sell, you're really stuck. I keep cutting the check. with this market. I I'm got a, a land uh, three years ago and hashtag no regrets. But now it's like, okay, when you're stuck, you're stuck. Like I have Thank seven you. properties in the market, just like frozen. So I have, so I have 32 properties on the market and 17 <laughs> of them are land. And it's cricket. No yeah. cricket. It's like every two weeks I have to cut the price down. Just imagine you cut three, four thousand dollars times that many properties. You know, you may imagine the feeling that you have, right? And it is it's not, and it doesn't go. So land is good, but it sucks. So it, it depends on, on, on what you do, right? So be careful. Don't jump into it, land unless you think it through. Give us a call. We'll give you an hour understanding of it. But hey, everything has a time and a place. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. I just wanted to add, uh, that was really good. And just for investors, I, I see a lot of our investors here. So just like now that you guys see how Sharar and all the guys analyze the properties heavily, it, like us on the other side of the investors, it gives us so much confidence. You know, like personally, I'm not as numbers person. I'm not as, as a, by any means, as the smartest are, but just like having these guys uh, analyzing the properties and they looking out for investors and, you know, a strong GP team that is probably going to lose money in this deal. But, uh, you know, looking always for the investors, give us so much confidence. And just when we come to talk to the investors, like you show, when we bring an, uh, a deal to our investors, it's because it, it's been already been overanalyzed and so much data back and forth. So that gives us so much confidence to bring uh, my column to you and some people asking questions and all that. Yeah, there's so many ways, you know, to, to look at deals and these guys do it like, very, very good. So uh, I don't know if you want to add something, Maria. I was waving. Yeah. People were sorry. Hey, so I mean, full disclaimer. Uh, so I come from FPNA on the financial forecast on the other stuff. It is almost certainty all the assumptions that we make today, they're gonna come out different even 120 days from now, right? In other words, our assumptions, some of them will be right, some of them will be wrong. The whole idea is that how many right assumptions is going to work for us that's going to be over and beyond the wrong assumptions, right? And every investment had a loss, right? Going back to the point, everybody should be at, you know, at least for us, whoever running the asset should be at Anis all the time. And some of the battles that we go through or debates that we go through, you got to see it on Thursdays. That's interesting. I should have a recording on that one. But we try our best. To, I mean, we, we understand the facts, some of the assumptions that we make. Uh, it's, it's not going to work out. So we try to be on the side of the market and try not to make too many bad decisions. So the good decisions supersedes the bad one and project becomes profitable, right? So that's part A. Part B, always take a look at the resiliency of the GP team, right? Thing will happen. Shooting will happen. Killing will happen. Cops will come in. 
a viable cloud marketable term. Can you get out of it? Right. That's the that's the other part of it. So share it. I have one question, but is here. Please. Yeah, yeah. So if you have done a lot of uh, single family stock, all that, particularly if you are selecting a group uh, for multifamily and some of the vectors you showed, how how do you vet? Uh, I'm just trying to understand what are your top top three four criteria, right? How do you vet deals? That's what you're asking me right now. Uh, not the deals. Let's say you have opportunity to be partner with, let's say, two three syndications, right? Okay. How do you select? one from the other that's a long answer okay let's say i'm a brand new lp right uh, i'll give a couple of scenarios right i'll give you a brand i'm a brand new lp and the other one i'm a professional lp that means i've been there done that right so from the brand new lp perspective i don't know much so i'll hang out with the team who's been there for quite a bit by design i know my return is not going to be as high but i'm going to hit the middle ground right as i'm growing up I want to offset a little bit more. And what you see, the if you go to the mature ones, they have been there, done that, and they're doing it, they're in the middle of it, it's there. But sometime within the new guys on the new team coming up, some of them will fall off after two or three years. Some of them will continue and become one of those good ones. So, And that's where you have to decide what team. So it's, I would say you go meet with them in person, you see their resume, you understand what they're coming from, and have they done well in their life previously before they have done it? And that's, to me, it's a, it's a big thing. I am who I am. And my past behavior till I'm 40 is typically will tell me who, which way I'm going to go, right? And if I am not that kind, what I need to be to go, I may get lucky. But beyond the luck, I'm not going to go far. So use your own judgment as if you're hiring them to protect your money and you're looking for and on that kind of a caliber team, right? So use that judgment, go meet them in person, see them outside the pitch and see how they talk, what they say, who they hang out with. You'll have a good pulse for it. And sometimes you have to take that jump with a leap of faith, right? And that, you, you're never going to get 100%. You'll get to 70, 80% at best. And you'll say, you know what? Hell with it. I want to do it. And that, that part has to come through. There you go. Thank you. Okay. I mean, you know, it can be like my family. You take my money. When you make money, I split. When you lose money, it's all yours, right? Doesn't quite work. Okay. Uh, let me see what position looking for Jonathan Massive. Okay. Oh. So uh, we are looking for an asset manager. Uh, and Sanja, and no, I'm not looking for <laughs> Sanja is looking for an no, sorry. Yes, yeah, Sanjay is looking for an asset manager. Uh, they don't have to be, um, they can be remote, but there has to be flexibility of, of, of traveling and looking over assets, especially in the Texas area. And they need to have finance background. And you know, they need to be able to say, hey, I have ran PL, I understand the balance sheets, I understand the integrity of how the numbers go around, and I'm coming in managing the PL, and I can ask the questions all the way down to the work order and understand the relationship. For it and a location, hey, stay where you're at, no issue, as long as you can travel. Uh, that's that. And then I'm looking for an analyst uh, for underwriting. We for our underwriting, we are moving out from the Excel template into a uh, software called Red IQ. Uh, this is pretty. Uh, this is one of the best softwares I've seen. Uh, so we have subscribed for that one, and uh, so that all of our partners can underwrite together. So we are taking some of those individual know-how out of the plate, baking into the system. The system will allow us to underwrite at the same way, same time, all the time. And system will help us understand uh, some of the data automatically. So we are switching over to Red IQ. Uh, Red IQ. IQ. It is owned by Barcadia, and, uh, but it's a pretty cool software. We like it. Uh, we are looking for someone who's dedicated to that. Again, needs to have finance background and FPNA probably. They understand PNL, and that kind of stuff. Uh, talk to Sanjay. Uh, just, uh, I would say just reach out to uh, Sanjay um, and reach out to one of us. I mean, on LinkedIn or WhatsApp or Facebook, whatever it is, and ask him. You know, his. I think he interviewed somebody already, uh, one or two. Let's please reach out to him. And then, then the red right, Those are the two positions we're looking for now. And if we can execute our business plan, we'll look for a couple more people. Who, who is uh, looking for that asset manager? I have a friend I'd like to recommend. 
Okay, it's Sanjay, S-A-N-J-A-Y at Massive.Capital. I already put it on the chat. His awesome, email. thank you, thank you. Oh, it's Capital, sorry, I misspell it. Thanks, yeah. So Jasmine, the Jasmine, this is Roweda. Would you email that to me, please? Sure. I'm at, I'm at the gym, so I can't write or type anything. I okay. can barely breathe. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I'll send that to you, uh-huh. Uh, yeah, so that's that's what we're looking for. So I think uh, if if everything goes all right, we'll try to bring in legal in house next year. But that's Paul is kind of decide as we go. It's good. Very good questions. Thank you, everybody. Uh, and is GP team just like buying? Uh, it's it's more than that, right? So if you buy an, uh, so I'll give a finance answer. So when we buy a stock, we believe we know something about the market that's gonna do whatever that they're gonna do. And that's typically we buy, right? And But if we think about it, if the market is uh, semi-efficient, then I know what you know, I bought it, you bought it, and market has priced out. So in general, when we buy stock, if we are regular uh, unsophisticated investors like this, or like us, then we don't know any additional information and to say the market's gonna go up or down, something like that. That means you're rolling the dice. And in this case, uh, if we take the same philosophy when you buy a property, it's a similar fashion to that. You have a little bit idea about the an asset and the location, but then you get to hang out with the operating team or the C-level team to understand the strategy. So in general, uh, the multifamily investors are much more in tune to the investment compared to a stock buyer buying in a stock. So, I mean, how many of us, I, I used to work at Shell. We all own Shell stock. I happen to sit onto the investor calls but how many of us, we bought a company and we sit into their quarterly calls and listen to their CEO talking about it and read their K1 versus a dominant part of the multifamilies. They read, you guys read your stuff. So you guys are much more, and uh, you guys have a higher knowledge base coming into the department. So it is not quite similar, uh, but you got to pick the right stock, right? Or the right company independent of the location. Good. I don't see any other question. Um, this is good. Uh, so the email back to you. That's provided Sorry. Sanjay at Massive is this to send the resume for the asset management position or as well for the underwriting position? So underwriting, I mean, you can show him both. I mean, you can show me the information about the underwriting position as well. And oh. for the underwriting, we're looking for ideally we're looking for somebody offshore. Uh, so we're trying to build that expertise. So we're trying to use the shell philosophy that the decision or the design of the core or the thinking base in the US, transactional base is outside, at least for now. Uh, so we can, our team can run. So example, as of now, our finance manager, he is he used to be with Shell working with me. He worked with me for five years at Shell, then he became an expat in Dubai. He went back to India, then he came back to us. And he's our junior finance manager. We can work on the round the clock. We have an asset tonight, send him an email, and he texts it by the time we wake up in the morning, it's already there, right? So something in that fashion we're, we're working it out. Okay. A good question. But if someone is fantastic, hey, we'll take a look at it. We're a sucker for people. Perfect. Okay. That, I, that's the Deloitte model too. <laughs> yeah. I mean, hey, Accenture, Deloitte, and all the typical consultancy, right? So McKinsey is staged in the U.S., Deloitte goes, you know, Accenture goes outside, right? Somebody's yeah. thinking, somebody's doing, right? That's, that's yeah. The, yeah. I, I worked. A, I worked in a model like that. It actually does work pretty good. You said you, the the system was working twenty four hours that way. That's so right. that's right. Yeah. I mean, we are small, tiny. We just started. Doesn't make any rhyme or reason, but hey, it sounds cool to talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. No problem. Sure. Do you have any plans to do the vertical integration, like build your own property management? As of now, no. Okay. Yeah. So what we have seen that if you run class C's, then bringing in the asset management in-house is a great way to go. And then if you were doing a class B and A, it's really PL management, right? Uh, so we're not, the majority of our class C's value that we're doing is with a smaller scale. We have a asset management already in terms of a partnership. So we haven't quite got there yet. In terms of the big ones that we try to buy, I would think it's a PL, so it's an asset management framework. 
Plus, we are so small as of now uh, that hasn't showed up yet. But we would like to not bring in asset management in-house. But if it needs to be, we'll, we'll do it. But it's not in our play right now. Yeah. Sorry, we are dancer. Typically, we'll say, hey, I want to bring the asset management. I want to manage tightly. I was like, no, it needs to be much easier, much easier than that. Makes sense. Thank you. That's good. No, thank you, everybody. Um, again, if you guys have any questions, uh, please reach out to one of us. And we appreciate all of the uh, questions and also sitting us through for the last uh, hour and a half as well. So thank you. Jasmine, thanks. Okay. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much, uh, Shara. Have a good night. Yeah, good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you. Yeah.